Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Metaphysical Podcast. Have you ever heard of the Mandela Effect? When Nelson Mandela passed away in 2013, a lot of people were confused because they remembered him dying back in the 90s or the 80s, depending on who you talk to. And there are lots of other examples of this Mandela Effect. Maybe you swear an event happened that didn't, or you remember that something existed that no longer does. Well, what's the deal? Well, there are a lot of theories out there, so we wanted to dig into the Mandela Effect in part one today. We'll be discussing about what this phenomenon is, what could have caused it, and some of the best examples out there that will have you convinced something weird is going on if you still had any doubt. So join remote viewer John Vivanco and me, investigative researcher Rob Counts, for a show that's out of this world. And if you're listening to us, the metaphysical podcast on a video platform or or whatever, uh, Apple, whatever it is, Spotify, Spotify, please leave us a five-star review. We totally appreciate that. It's going to help us reach more people. And also make sure you like and subscribe because you don't want to miss these upcoming shows. Yeah, they're going to be yeah. rad. Yeah. And the Mandela effect. I mean, this is, yeah, this is one of my favorites, actually. Yeah, so seriously. Weird. It's um, it's one of those strange theories, you know, back in um, back in 2018, um, when Ben and I had just started our show, we he didn't he hadn't even heard of it yet. And Mike, this was my co-host for another show that I run for those of you at home. Um, Edge of Wonder. Right. Yeah. And um, awesome. he had never heard of it. And. And I was like, dude, we have to do a show on this. Yeah. And he was like, well, I've never heard of this. You know, he was like complaining about it. And then finally we did a show and it was like probably our first viral show. We went out into Times Square and we were uh, interviewing people and all of that, um, trying to get people to understand like what had gone on because it's such right. a bizarre phenomena, this Mandela effect. Oh, yeah. And um, John, you have a little bit of background info on kind of how the Mandela effect started right so what yeah what exactly I mean, it, went was, on? it was it was fiona broom she's a para psychologist paranormal research not a parapsychologist per se but a paranormal researcher been in the field for a while i think she mostly focused on ghost hunting and actually has some really interesting theories around ghost hunting um and so i've always enjoyed listening to her um and her books reading her books she's got quite a few but she had been at dragon con which is a big convention that I don't know much about is it's, it's people just uh, kind of dressing up as their favorite superhero sort of thing, but they have a lot of different things that go on at that convention. So she was speaking at it one year and back from what I understand back in one of the, the, like the green room of speakers who are waiting to go on, she and some other speakers were talking about um, the death of Nelson Mandela and this is in 2009. Before this is in 2009, right? Yeah. So, so they're, they're talking about it, and other people are like, no, 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 he never died. I don't remember the funeral. But she remembered it along with a bunch of others who said it was like a three-day event. It was on TV constantly. And at that point, uh, I think a couple of them had coined the term. This is some, like, a, we can call this the Mandela effect, basically. So after that, Fiona built the website. And this is 2009, 2010 time frame. So Mandela didn't die until what, 2013? 2013. So, right. So this is like before he died. This is that in-between space. But it's weird too, because you know, how many times has this actually happened? I mean, if you look, have have you have you looked at the amount of premature obituaries that occur with news websites? Like, for instance, one year CNN had like seven premature obituaries get published, for instance. Mm -hmm. And, and the amount of premature obituaries is kind of weird to me. It's, it's one of those things it's like, wait a second. I mean, you know, maybe they died. They really died. And then they Mandela effect. And then they pulled it off. They pulled off the obituary. But this happens constantly. You can find a huge list of, of these obituaries on people that were put out. And then they're not dead. That's I mean, really weird. That's weird, too. Yeah, I actually myself have a really um, kind of personal experience with this, which is, you know, weird. I mean, I was um, I was a front page newspaper designer back in 2013 for like a local newspaper. And I. 
I remember getting the task of laying out the front page that Nelson Mandela died. And I was what year? What year was this? It's 2013. Okay. So it's 2013. Nelson Mandela's just died. And I'm sitting at my desk. I have a big, I have a couple of big like screens, you know, like I have two like 30 inch screens because I'm laying out like pages. Right. And I'm just sitting there staring at my screen baffled. And I'm like, this guy already died. Like, I remember him dying. I remember the funeral. And I looked over because Ben was the photographer. And I looked over at Ben and I was like, dude, he he remembers me coming up to him and being like, didn't this guy already die? Because he was the one who had to give me the photo that I was going to put on the front page. Right. Right. And and we were so we, like he he I don't remember how like if he was as confused as I was, but I just remember staring at the screen for a really long time being freaked out. I even talked to the editor in chief and I was like, this guy already died. And um, yeah, come to find out it didn't happen. And then a few years later, I start seeing this thing called the Mandela effect. And I was like, that's hilarious because, you know, I had that that experience of just right. being super confused. And I remember CNN. I remember CNN. I remember the funeral. I remember all the hubbub over his death. You know? It's just really right. weird. So I don't, yeah, I don't remember that. I, I must have been in a different reality from you at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the problem that I have with the whole Mandela effect is, is that you can claim just about anything is a Mandela effect if you misremembered something. But the other side of that is so when you have the personal experiences and other people have those personal experiences, that's really what the Mandela effect is, whether it's a false memory or something else. It's literally like, because how do masses of people misre- misremember something? Or, how can or the masses same of thing. people misremember? They'll like misremember the same thing. Right. How could they do that? That's that's yeah. just in, impossible to me. The Mandela effect is is one of those things that that trips me out because there's you know, everybody misremembers. Everybody misremembers, but the phenomena is actually about masses of people misremembering the same thing. And so when I see these news articles online from supposed experts psychologists or whatever saying, well, it's just mass misremembering. And that's really all there is to it. Someone made a suggestion or something and then everybody's missed. No. And, and, and I don't, and anything around memory is actually an unknown when it comes to science. Everything is a theory when it comes to memory, because, because we don't know exactly how memories are stored. Right. And, and nobody actually knows, psychologists, scientists, biologists, nobody actually knows how memories are stored. And so this is where the, the issue lies. For, for websites to news organizations to come out and straight up say that Mandela effect is just misremembering is not truthful. So there is a phenomena happening. It is, it is something that people are remembering in mass scale of something different. And that is the phenomena. When you get into all the esoteric stuff surrounding it, that's not necessarily the phenomena. So I've noticed that people can get very agitated about the Mandela effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because it's like, oh, you people are, you're just misremembering everything. That's, or, that's- you know, or, you know, the other side of that coin is, or they're overzealous and think everything is a Mandela effect now. <laughs> right. There's <laughs> that too. <laughs> Once something that they didn't know how to spell is spelled incorrectly, they're convinced that, or, you know, it's spelled a different way. They're convinced. Uh, but, you know, even that though is a good example of sometimes those are, are actual Mandela effects, I think. And then other times it's just someone misremembering. And that's why this is such a contentious thing is it's very easy for, you know, kind of science minded people to just kind of like, you know, uh, right. Just the flipping of those words, like the Berenstain, Berenstein bears thing. It's like the flipping of the word. It's the flipping of the letters is just, okay. There's that can be very confusing because even when you go back into the so-called Mandela effects where letters flipped, it's like, at the end of the day, you really just don't know. I you mean, don't. 
you just don't know and you become confused as to what the actual real thing was to begin with. Um, but the curious thing to me is that, so Berenstain, Berenstein bears, bears, I've got no, I've got no like connection with that at all, as far as like a Mandela effect goes. But I, I would think that they're, that all those parents out there who are reading that to their child and, and building reading comprehension would know what that is, right? Yeah. They would, they would know what it originally was because, because it's about telling your child a story and getting involved in reading comprehension. How can so many people, unless it was just suggestion at first, I don't know. I mean, I have no idea. Well, and the Berenstein Bears one, in my opinion, isn't necessarily a good example if you're trying to convince someone that the man no, right. is real. This is one of those traps, I think. And, and I'm not saying that that's not necessarily one. The reason why I bring that up is because when you're talking about last names, it's much more likely that Steen is in someone's name than Stain. Right. Stain is never in a name. Right. So it's like, even if it was Baron Stain at the beginning, but everyone's remembering it as Baron Steen because last names never have Stain in it. They always have, it's a Steen, you know? Right. right. So it's, um, it, that's not necessarily a good example, but, but like what, what, blows my mind a little bit more is when things in pop culture and movies change, right? Because I mean, there are, there are movies that are flat out missing now. And, and now I have like a little bit of a personal experience with this one too, because it, I don't get it. I don't understand what's happened. But when we talk about, when we talk about this movie that Sinbad was, you know, allegedly in called Shazam, Right. And Shazam was a movie where Sinbad is a genie. And, you know, he it's this whole like little kid movie, uh, you know, whatever. I remember seeing this movie as a VHS when I would go in to rent movies. Right. I remember seeing it all the time. There was commercials for it all the time on TV. I watched tons of TV. Right. And what's weird is a couple of years after the Sinbad movie came out, they came out with another movie to make a little bit more money called Kazam. And that was with Shaq. Okay. Now, when I was a kid, I would go in to look at VHS tapes. Like it was every Friday. My, my mom would take my brother and I to like video blockbuster. world blockbuster, you know, our version of blockbuster in Rhode Island It's called video world. You can look it up. Anyway, I used to go in there and I would look at VHS tapes, right? And um, one of the, I, I remember just now in terms of memory, when you're a child, your memory is a lot clearer because you don't have, it's a blank slate. You're a blank slate. You remember things clear, right? We were talking about horror movies the other, like a couple of weeks ago. And I was telling them about this one VHS I used to always look at called um, House 2. That was the name of the horror movie. And I described that it was a really rotten looking hand holding a key. And it was like, and here it is, right? I'm describing this specifically thing, this specific uh, VHS cover to him. And Lindsay pulls it up and I'm like, there it is. It's exactly what I remember, right? Right. And so why am I remembering all of this stuff from back then? I remember the VHS cover of this Shazam Sinbad movie. And I remember thinking, oh, that's dumb. They came out with like a, a knockoff called Kazam with Shaq. Right. Right. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, it's just this whole thing. This one really sent me for a trip because it's like. I, I remember this, you know, I remember it being on TV and changing the channel because I didn't want to watch it, you know? Right. I, I don't remember any of it. Kazam, Shazam, none of it. Like, I don't, I wasn't even, I was probably in some other completely, utter, utterly, totally different reality. Because I don't remember even, I don't even remember the Shaq dude or whoever he is. Shaq, he's a big basketball player, right? He's still around now. He's yeah, still yeah. Like Man, I was in art school at that time. Right. And I was just like in a hole of dude. Yeah. <laughs> and in late in the late nineties, when I entered art school myself, it, yeah. that was it for me. It was like, yeah. I didn't watch anything ever like for yeah, like a exactly. five or six year period. Like right. I get it. That's yeah. <laughs> so that could be the problem for me on this, but, but what you're talking about. Okay. So for one person, what your Mandela effect there could mean absolutely nothing. 
you know, that didn't experience it. But for those people who experienced it, and you're not alone on this particular thing, not alone at all, because it's a big one, they're passionate about it. Because see, this is what it's about. Like what, what the memory is creates a passion about it. And that's, that's what, it, honestly, like the ones who, who, who think there's no phenomena here, only misremembering, are not going into their own experience ultimately because i bet you it's just like psychic phenomena no matter if somebody believes in psychic phenomena or not even hardened skeptics against psychic phenomena i guarantee you every single one of them has had a psychic experience i guarantee you it's just something, part of being yeah. human right and if they focused on that they would go wait yeah there is something happening here oh my gosh right so it's right. the emotional driven side of this that really makes it what it is it's incredible <clears throat> I mean, I'm convinced of certain things that another person will just go, they just think I'm nuts. You know? Well, and, and you know, what's interesting, John, is that you and I both went to art school. We both studied art history quite a bit. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so you and I, a lot of times we can have conversations, pretty deep conversations about art that I think other people have a hard time because because they're not aware of the history and specific right. paintings that you start really looking at. I spent tons of my college career in museums, just staring at and drawing from paintings and totally. really trying to understand a lot of stuff. Right. And you have an experience with one. I have an experience yeah, with one I mean, painting like, you have with another. So it's 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 the Henry the Eighth turkey leg painting <laughs> that doesn't exist. I mean, OK. Henry the Eighth. Like we're we're sitting there in class. I have an art history class right before lunch, and every single class I'm starving, right? And we were studying this painting of Henry the Eighth, just like this, just like you're seeing on the screen, except that he is holding a turkey leg in his hand. He's holding a turkey leg, and we're discussing why is he holding a turkey leg, and and he, now he's holding this like um... it's like a glove. A glove or something? Yeah. Right. But no, he was holding a turkey leg. And I remember it so vividly because I was starving. I was just staring at the turkey leg. It's all glistening. He did a great job on it. it. It was fantastic turkey leg painting. <laughs> and and I'm like going, man, I'm so hungry. I'm so hungry. Why has he got this turkey leg here? And then I remember even after we finished that uh, particular lesson, the the next classes, I would go back to the turkey leg and look at the turkey leg painting because I was always starving. And I was always wondering, why do turkey legs look so good, but they don't taste very good? They don't look like they taste, to me at least. I don't know. You You're know, right, you go to you're... like Disneyland or some kind of theme park and they'll sell these big turkey legs. Yes, and yes. And you're going, and you go, wow, man, that's just like, I'm going to have that because that's what the elite eat. You know, And then you is... eat it and you're like, no, nah, it's not good. You know what's weird though is like I've I've come to the I've come to realize that it really depends on who's cooked your turkey leg. <laughs> right. I, I, I've eaten a couple of turkey like I've gone to some of these fairs, I've eaten turkey legs, I've been like, why did I buy that? It was terrible. Right. And then a few times I've eaten turkey legs from different places and I've been like, that was the most delicious turkey I've ever eaten in my life. Like, why don't I do this more often? Right. <laughs> Yeah, it depends on who makes it. Yeah, Must. actually, I mean that's a whole thing in and of itself. Like food, if somebody's agitated when they're making food or they don't care, yeah. don't eat it. Yeah, no, it's got the energy in it, right? Mom, yeah. mom always making things with love and it tasting better is a thing. Actually, that'd be a fun episode here yeah. at some point. Like, yeah, the energy oh, I was on the opposite better. side of that. My mom hated cooking, so everything was, you know, mm. I'm not going to talk bad about it. Yeah, no, you don't want to get called or, you know, get taken into a room and beaten by your mother. Exactly. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. So so the then, you know, I remember the Henry VIII painting. I remember the turkey leg myself. But like you have that personal experience. And for me, it's a little bit more fuzzy. But what is a, crystal clear for me is all of the debates in art school, people in art school, yeah, yeah. everything right now in art school, you have to understand is that especially as art has been declining, I'll say over time. More everything of, has like everything. music, art, music. There are no more like super duper alternative zones of anything. No, it, it, they're very under 
they're very under the radar. They're still functioning. They're still there, but they're quietly doing what they need to do. And they're very successful. It's just people don't know about them because it's the modern contemporary stuff that's getting pushed. Yeah. And that's all for a reason and a rabbit hole that we won't go into here. But the debates around art have been just very, very intense over the last 30, 40 years. Uh, more than that. Of course, more than that, right? Because like we're talking about we, we've departed from art speaking for itself and just being extremely beautiful, wonderful, high quality and meaningful for, for the individual to a situation now where it's almost like you have to argue to make your point on why a piece of art is valuable. Where <laughs> right. it, it should be valuable on its own. Now it's like, oh, no, this banana duct tape, to, tape a to a wall is wall. meaningful. Like, yeah. give me a break. Right. I yeah. mean, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, to be kind of direct about it, how much money did you just launder for real? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. That's yeah. That's going to, that's going to get you off if you start talking about that. Yeah. Stuff. Right, right, right. <laughs> so it's like, um, you know, Mona Lisa is, and here's the, uh, the famed uh, duct tape uh, and banana on the wall that was sold for $120,000 in art Basel down in uh, Miami. One of their big hubs now for selling contemporary art. Um, Mona Lisa, we need to talk about this because when yeah, because I was this, in, that's a big, that's a big one in every single art school, at least in the past. Yes. In the when question. I was in school, the biggest debate was whether Mona Lisa was smiling. This is the Mona Lisa painting. It's not, it's what, not. What do you mean by that? <laughs> what do you mean by that? You know exactly what I'm talking about, man. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to pull it out of you, John. <laughs> she's she's she. Her eyes are smiling. Her mouth is smiling. And all of the discussions was, why is she not smiling? <laughs> no, or is she smiling? Or, or it was she debate. smiling. Now she is smiling. Yeah. This is, yeah. So the this debate that went on for literally centuries was, what expression? the Mona Lisa had that she was, she was conveying. And this idea, this going back and forth of, is she smiling? Is she smirking? What does it mean is no longer there because somehow this painting is, it's undeniable. She's smiling here. Yeah. Her eyes especially are smiling. Yeah. Her, her mouth is a little bit, not wanting to smile, but it's still it smiling, is. but her eyes are really smiling and that didn't exist before. Yes. And, you know, um, Leonardo was a master of expression beyond almost, I think, anyone that's ever painted. He there was energy behind the expression. It, it almost had thoughts like the painting itself had some living expression to it, which is hard to explain. Right. Um but this this debate and 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 so the Mona Lisa has become one of the strangest Mandela effects because this debate no longer exists of whether or not Mona Lisa is smiling or not. And yet right. this is the claimed Mona Lisa painting that's been in the Louvre for the last 20 years. Yeah, exactly. Unless they, you know, put up a reproduction and then uh, because they do that with some. They do cool. do that. You know, they'll put up reproductions. They won't tell people and they'll hide the original. I mean, come on. It was in the movie 2012. Don't you remember? Yeah. But if you go back and look at like at places where the Mona Lisa was in documentaries and all of those things, it's that same expression. Right. Right. So it, even if they hit it at some point over the last 10 years <clears throat> and they put up a new one, you know, all of the all of the content from the 90s and you know, okay, that's obviously a fake painting of Mona Lisa right there. And the yeah. that is a terrible painting. It's a terrible one. It looks like, yeah, that Mona Lisa looks like it has issues. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, we were pulling up a, so for those of you listening to the podcast, we were pulling up a clip from the Da Vinci Code that had the Mona Lisa in the background. She looks like my disciplinarian great grandmother. I'm, I'm not digging it. <laughs> It's a good way to describe that that look. <laughs> that would have been what the debate was about with the Da Vinci right. Code uh, painting, right? Um, yeah, and and that's that's just really strange, especially when you start seeing 
paintings like Henry VIII and Mona Lisa just changing before our eyes with all of the history. Like, why debate if it's very obvious she's smiling? There would have been no debates. I mean, we're talking about very intense debates, like people writing papers on this stuff and, and trying to understand how Leonardo ex executed an expression that's so... Right. I mean, art them. history courses portions of art history courses were on what's going on with the Mona Lisa. I mean, it doesn't exist. I mean, gosh, that's amazing. So you go to art school these days and nobody's questioning the painting now. There's no like discourse on that stuff. That's incredible. I mean, wow. Yeah. Because I remember too in, in class, you know, so what we spoke about. It's like one of those things that we went into. What, why, what's going on? How master painter being able to do this, to have people question the expression is incredible. Now you, you obviously don't question it. Yeah. Study, a new study says yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> look, here's my new study. I looked at it and she's smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jason Daly. Um, yeah. So, and, and, you know, the other part of that is like the, the debates that would go on about why in the world is Henry the eighth holding a Turkey leg. It's weird, right? Like it was in the painting. Everyone was debating it at the time and trying to figure out what was going on and why the painter painted that and what it meant. And, you know, now it's just, it's a glove or something. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't, I can't, I don't know what to say. I don't know. I think that, you know, when you get into these things of like um, um, recorded stuff, like paintings or movies, like what you're talking about, and you go to like, for instance, the Jaws girl from Moonraker, you know, and the braces, oh, and she's no longer got braces. I mean, that was another one that affected me because I was a kid when I saw that. And, and Obviously, the connection point between Jaws and the girl with the braces are the braces. That's yeah. the connection point, right? right? Why, like contextually, well, yeah, look, there's the braces. Did, did, is that Photoshopped on or is that not Photoshopped on? Because the ones I found, she's not got this braces. This is Photoshopped on. Okay, got it. Right. So yeah. that's how she originally looked. And that, you know, I mean, come on. Yeah. So okay. So Moonraker. For everyone at home who doesn't know, Moonraker was a part of the James Bond series of movies. Came out in 1979, and there was a a villain in the movie named Jaws. Jaws. Now Jaws was this like giant of a man, seven five something like that. It appeared in the movie anyway. He had, he had teeth. Yeah. yeah, he had the genetics from the past, actually. <laughs> right. Right. And this actually the same actor was in um, Happy Gilmore as well. Yeah, oh, he was. Yeah. Uh, but Obviously anyway, you remember that. Right. He had this. He had these teeth. Right. Like you can see he's got these like silver teeth. And there is this heart kind of heartwarming, funny scene at the end where he sees this girl. What, in a grocery store or something? He's at checkout. And, <laughs> I, don't and the know girl, I don't remember. <laughs> anyway, the girl. No, no. She was smiling somewhere. Gosh, I don't even remember. But anyway, he sees this girl and there is this scene that everyone remembers where she, he falls in love with her because she smiles and she has braces. So her teeth right. look like his. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, oh, you know, the sorry. That was really funny. The grocery store thing was a remake of that <laughs> commercial. Wait, wait. Because we had a Mandela effect video where we were trying to prove that the girl had braces and one of the old commercials that showed this Jaws come into like, so the actor who played Jaws goes into the grocery store and the girl at the, um, at the counter has braces and they look at one another and they make that connection to the movie. Oh, okay. I so, thought, I didn't know what you're talking about. I thought there was a, like another Mandela effect doubled on top of this. Like, no, yeah. see, this is, this is the Moonraker now, this is the Moonraker uh, scene where he sees this girl and somebody's somebody is CGI braces back on her because they're okay. trying to remember this. OK, but if you get the VHS and you look at this movie, she doesn't have braces. OK, right now in this this one of the ways that we were able to prove that this was a thing that this this like happened and we're not out of our minds is that there was some commercial that was done over the last 10 or 20 years where or more actually where it shows 
Jaws, the, the, the guy who plays Jaws, go into a grocery store and the girl at the counter has the braces on her teeth and he starts falling in love with okay. the girl, right? Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, that's, see, that's another one of those those uh, Mandela effects that I passionately remember. I mean, yeah. like when I was a kid, I don't know how many times I watched Moonraker, you know? So I don't know. You know, like th th that's also contextually relevant, so contextually relevant to, to not have her have braces begins to make less and less sense on their connection. It doesn't make any sense in that movie. Right. And that, and that also goes into like, you know, the memes, memes that are built around some of these films. And then mm. you find out that, wait, e the, either the meme is wrong and everybody followed one person's wrong meme or it changed. And that's when you get to things like, is it fly you fools or run you fools from the Lord of the Rings when Gandalf mm. was holding on to the edge and, and he, he's about to be destroyed by the Balrog, right? That big demon thing. And right when the Balrog is falling, his tail whips and grabs. Uh, oh, no, his, uh, his whip, right? Yeah, his whip. Yeah. yeah, and he says, run, you fools, or he says, fly, you fools. But then you have all these memes that were all about run, you fools, right? Mm -hmm. But actually, you watch the movie, he says, fly, you fools. Mm -hmm. So is that a Mandela effect, or is that... No. Well, so for this one, I feel like anyone who thinks that Gandalf said run, you fools, is just remembering it wrong. Because I like the Lord of the Rings books I read m multiple times when I was young, up and even into In my the adult. other reality, man. Well, right, right. And that's their <laughs> argument. Right. But I remember as a as a child, even reading these books, they were my favorite books. And I was always like shocked at how. Gandalf said things. I like remembered how Gandalf said things because it was like, and then when the movies came out, I was waiting for that scene to see if they would make him say fly you fools or not. Cause I wanted them to. And when he did, I right. was like, yes, they got that one. I'll check that off the list, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and, and then, you know, you, you have really excited people trying to find new Mandela effects. And then there it's like, I just feel like this one is not, it's not the greatest example. But then when I hear your personal, ex like, or actually, I should say, talking about memes right now, the craziest meme that I think is like one of the first memes is is this Matrix meme of um, what if I told you and it's right. like Morpheus, right? And then you can write anything else underneath. What if I told right. you and what if I told you that whole scene never even happened in the Matrix? No, you like, can't tell me that because it did happen. It did happen. This it did this happen. one, this one I have a problem with because everyone when this movie came out, nineteen ninety nine or whatever, we all watched it like hundreds of times. Like we mem practically memorized this movie, you know. And so, I, what I, no, I I don't I don't believe that that didn't happen. I'm going to have to rewatch it because that did happen in the movie because that that was such a huge line. It was that a, was such a huge. That's like huge the crux. Line. It's like yeah. the girl with the braces. I mean, come on. It is. It <laughs> like totally our, is. Our, is, okay, is this like retro causal type stuff? I mean, what's uh, we won't go into this, but <laughs> we're going to. OK, so for those of you yeah. at home listening, we are going to have two episodes going through and talking through some of these Mandela effects and then two more episodes where we get into what is causing the Mandela effect right. and why all of this is happening. This so. is not this is annoying as all heck. I mean, this is annoying is. as I mean. I didn't know. Okay. I got I to write this one down because I'm going to research that one. I mean, I know <laughs> like, like I've asked if you get to the Lord of the Rings thing, I know that you're some kind of like Lord of the Rings, like super fan, yeah. you know, and, and probably Harry Potter super fan. No, I hate Harry Potter. Yeah. <laughs> Lindsay knows that. I'm just totally messing with you. So I don't like Harry Potter either, but, but you get to the, um, to, to the Lord of the Rings part and I swear you're from a different reality because everybody that I have spoken to and asked them about that, it's been a bunch of people. I say, what did Gandalf say? And they say, run, you fools. And then I show them the clip and they're so confused. How do you misremember that? He said that all the time, though. He would tell people to fly all the time. That's why I thought it was so cool. <sighs> Man. 
I'm not, I'm not, I'm, you're from, no, you're from a different reality. <laughs> you know what's funny about this, John, is you can, you can go ahead and remote view what reality I'm from, okay? All right. <laughs> All right. And you're like, not even going to remote view the movie or just like, where the hell's Rob from? Where the hell's Rob from? from? <laughs> but that's why I like these Mandela Effect discussions too, is because is because people get kind of so passionate about it and they, right. they remember a certain thing. Right. And it's like, together we have to figure out what the heck is going on because there's right. mass amounts of people remembering one thing and mass amounts of people remembering others. And if you bring like, if you bring mathematical confidence into these things, it kind of gets interesting because it, it mathematically, it doesn't actually make sense that a certain amount of people remember something the same way. Think about that. Like if there's enough people remembering something a certain way, how could it be mathematically probable that that's right. people forgetting? Yeah, exactly. That exactly. doesn't make any sense, actually. It doesn't make sense. No, uh huh. I and okay. So, for instance, you get to the avocado thing. Haas, yeah, avocado. Yes. Like, I didn't even. I didn't. I mean, every once in a while, I'll, I'll look at the 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 whole Mandela effect stuff to see what new things people have figured out. And I will tell you that, you know, my family had avocado farms. They grew avocados. I would help out. And I remember the way it was spelled because it would be on order forms. It would be on the crates. And it was spelled H-A-A-S. H-A-A-S. I remember this. My family remembers this. Everybody that I know in the avocado industry remembers this. Now, all of a sudden, it's H-A-S-S. -S. So here's another thing. See, these things don't impact you unless you have a deep personal experience with it. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt that it was double A and not double S. And that's the, you know, the thing that really trips me out about this. It's like, even though those like little one word flips, one letter flips can be easily written off, this can't be written off with me. It just can't. Because, because you, I, you have a personal experience with it. Personal experience with it. It isn't somebody, it isn't me like misremembering. It's not because everybody was spelling it that way. It's not somebody suggesting and then it's, it can't be because I had never heard of that one until just recently. So I don't know. It's very well, strange. You know, what's interesting, John, is I grew up across the street from a Haas family. And oh you did. Okay. And guess how guess how they spelt their last name? Double A or double S? Double, double A. A. Double A. Because, okay. Because that's the that is it's a Jewish last name. That's the way that you spell that last name. And so when I first saw this one, you know, my reaction was like, well, did they change the spelling to a non-Jewish spelling to avoid kind of some type of anti-Semitism or something, right? Because right. this is a, an ongoing theme, uh, especially after, you know, 1940. Oh, I see. Right. But, but it turns out that I couldn't find anything that said that they, that they did. It was just always spelled this way. And that just caused me to be really confused because I'm like, there, to my knowledge, it's a, it's a Jewish last name, H-A-A-S. You know, I grew up across the street from a family named that. And I remember Haas Avocados being spelled that way. Right. Yeah. It was always spelled that way. Always. Yeah. That's the, that's the thing. And, and even though I don't take the one letter flipping around kind of thing that seriously, um, I had the experience with turmeric, how do you know, I'm turmeric, uh, turmeric, turmeric situation where it was literally like, okay, so I, I, I won a spelling bee when I was a kid. And the letter that I won on was this right here. T so the word that you won on R I C. The word that you won on was, was turmeric. 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 So I'm I I can be very bad at spelling these days. And you know, remote viewers actually make up their own words to describe things because you're sensing and feeling things in a remote viewing session. And it's like sometimes there just aren't words for you to like use to express things. So we always make up our own words. Um, and I'm not the best at spelling anymore because of all that. But 
I know turmeric was spelled with an R because I won that dang spelling bee and nobody's going to tell me any different. So, okay. But see, this is the thing. Here's the weird part of all of this. If you look online right now, it, it is spelled with the R right there. The T-U-R. It is. Um, about five years ago, I was going through the cupboard to find some turmeric. And in the cupboard, we had two bottles. They both were spelled T-U-M-E-R-I-C, okay? They both were spelled that way. And I was like, that was weird. I was really confused. So I went online because I knew of Mandela Effect stuff and everybody was talking about it. Everybody was talking about how the R is now gone in the middle of turmeric, weird. right? And I researched it too. So I, I pulled up Microsoft Word. <clears throat> I typed in turmeric and turmeric and it was showing turmeric as a misspelling and turmeric as the correct spelling. I screenshotted it online, you know, to save the photographs because I had heard some people say that sometimes these things will change. They'll flip back and forth. So I wanted to track this to understand what would happen to go back to see if the photo, the screenshots that I took flip, right? Unfortunately, my hard drive, it died. So I lost all those photographs, but go earlier this year, Earlier this year, Heather and I are talking and she get, tells me to grab some turmeric. I grab it. And now the R is there. Now the R is there. So I researched again and people are talking about it, how it flipped back. And now the proper spelling is with the T-U-R, right? So now you can go in Microsoft Word and type both and it will spell check T-U-M-E-R-I-C and uh, it's good. Like that's, or that's not good. That's not how you spell it as anyway, yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm getting all confused with the spelling stuff. Like I'm mixing everything up. But you understand what I'm saying? It's like, these things seem to be flipping back and forth. And now where it was, it flipped one way. Now it's the other way. Now, what is going on here? Like, seriously, what is going on? I yeah, to it's, if I'm just insane. I know. And, and a lot of people, that's what makes this this theory um or effect so compelling right is you know you can dig in and 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 I, I mean i i think the biggest mandela effect aside from Na nelson mandela himself is ed mcmahon publishers clearinghouse <laughs> ed mcmahon publishers clearinghouse i witnessed hundreds of <laughs> commercials of Ed McMahon showing up at people's house with a big check and him giving people the check from Publishers Clearinghouse. And now that's like is... that's like what you what you watched on TV when you were homesick. Right? Or you're like homesick. Every day. Yes, you're right. You're right. It was on during the you day. You saw Ed McMahon day. going to somebody's yeah. house, like in between soap operas and stuff. Or you know? or as a commercial during family ties or whatever else you were watching. <laughs> right. At the time, you know? He did go to people's houses. He did. So what's the problem with this? The problem is that there is no record of Ed McMahon ever working for Publishers Clearinghouse anymore, and he never arrived at people's homes with checks. No. He did. No, yeah, no, 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 no. No, no, no. He was the one who presented. He. It was the whole, it was the big deal. He was huge. He even talked about it on Johnny Carson. He, like he, he, he No, the, but the Johnny Carson interview, that there is, an interview where, or there are a couple of things that Johnny Carson and David Letterman said that we're going to pull up here just to, just to rewatch that seem to have some remnants or allude to him doing that work. Yeah. This is, this is not, no, this is pretty new to me. No, the no, Ed McMahon what? one is the, the, the father of Mandela effects because absolutely like that. Yeah. How? No, that can't be. I got to research this one. Ed McMahon. I think Lindsay's going to pull something up right now. She's working on getting it open from uh, from YouTube, it looks like. This is okay. uh, Johnny Carson on Letterman. I don't believe they talk about the um, phenomena, but you're going to see Johnny hold up a check that says Publishers Clearinghouse. Winner. Oh, my God. <laughs> hey. I want to make 
Yeah, and now the reason why this is funny and everyone's laughing so hard is because everybody know Ed McMahon was Johnny Carson's right hand man, right? He was the guy that sat in the chair and was like, ah, yes, sir, right, to everything that Johnny said. And so Johnny coming on David Letterman's show, which was after his show at that at that time, he's making a joke about Ed McMahon here, right? right. Like that he's won the check that everybody's been seeing Ed McMahon on these commercials go to people's homes for. Like it actually doesn't make sense contextually for him to bring this check unless Ed McMahon was involved the way he was with Publishers Clearinghouse. Right. And it says Publishers Clearinghouse on that check. So that's strange is that there's these like weird remnants of of yeah. Ed McMahon in involvement. And that yet, is crazy. He's been that wiped. Is crazy. There are even statements on Publishers Clearinghouse website saying Ed McMahon never worked directly for for Publishers Clearinghouse. What the heck? No, but, no. but what's so weird about this, John, is think about when you're involved in a job or when you when you've created a film or you've done something in your life like it has some type of effect on your life. What how did Obviously, this isn't a major thing, right? But how did Ed McMahon's life change from one version of reality to the other if he was never involved in Publishers Clearinghouse? <laughs> His whole life would be different. Think about it. That, that was literally in the 80s. That was the biggest, that was the most memorable commercial online. It was huge. Just everywhere, dude. I mean, everybody was dreaming of getting a check from him. I mean, from that's why it was so hilarious for Johnny Carson to bring that to David Letterman. I mean, it's not funny now. It's really lame, actually. But it's 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 like that's what you're a kid. You're watching that and you're going, wow, I really want him to come to my house with that million dollar check. I remember that. Yeah. Wow. That's cr like I did not I did not know about this. I had heard about it like on the edges, on the sides, but I did not know the depths of this. So there's like remnants. There's like little pieces yes. of these actual things Proof. that are hanging and floating about. Yeah. yeah, there are. Here's another quick clip that alludes to Ed McMahon. Watch. I'm doing my part all this week. I'm eating my TV dinners frozen. <laughs> well, we've, we've talked about uh, Mr. Meese. Apparently, he's uh, in a little bit of trouble. Uh, he's been accused, and nobody has proved it yet, of giving government jobs to people who, who gave him money. Uh, as a matter of fact, he got a letter from Ed McMahon today saying, congratulations, you may have already won a million dollars. Dude! Okay. Yeah. Congratulations, you may have already won was their line, and it was coming from Ed. You hear? Right. He was yep. involved. Like this is a this is a legit remnant of something else that they that couldn't get wiped. Yeah, crazy, right? So you've you've got these aspects that are hanging out in, in reality still. So what is that all about? Yeah, okay, I've got another <laughs> one. This one might be the best remnant that I found related to a Mandela effect. Well, that I'm aware of, okay? Because we've researched this quite a bit between, you know, you, myself, Ben, different people that I work with. All right. Sally, this, and this is where it gets a little bit crazy, y'all, okay? Sally Field, when she won her Oscar, she was so moved by winning the Oscar that she said, you like me. You really like me. Right. And um, now it's not that quote at all. Sally Field actually goes out there and says, I can't deny the fact that you like me right now. You like me. What's so strange about this is that Okay, we're going to pull this up. You can hear this. No one remembers this, by the way. I the fact that you like me right now. You like me. That was weird. Just weird in and of itself. Okay, now, it's very interesting that it's Sally Field who's, I don't know, line changed because Sally Field's brother or sibling worked for CERN, dude. Oh, that's weird. Weird, right? That's so really weird. 
Okay, so for those of you at home who don't know, CERN is basically one of the biggest things people point to as being responsible for the timeline bizarre shifts with the Mandela effect. Of course, it's speculation. It's important to recognize that because none of us really know what's going on. But Sally Field, it, this is her brother. Her, her brother worked at CERN. And the fact that this happened to Sally Field and that her timeline got messed up with her brother working at CERN is like a very strange coincidence. Yeah, I mean, I guess when you're when you're looking at things that could be construed as timeline based and you've got a family connection there and you're involved in the Mandela effect, yeah, people are going to look at that because really they don't have anywhere else to go. Right. Where else do you go with it? Yeah, where where <laughs> are you going? Her, brother, her brother's doing all of it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's your brother. It's Sally Fields' brother behind the whole thing. <laughs> um, yeah, obviously we're kidding, but the, right. Now, the remnant here is very interesting because that's that's cool. The remnant is cool. The, yeah. yeah. The, this remnant is very interesting because I when I was a kid, I used to watch James Jim Carrey movies all the time. Like I thought he was hilarious on In Living Color. I couldn't get enough of like uh, Ace Ventura Pet Detective. It was just the funniest oh, thing. Man. I mean, the, guy is talking, the guy is talking with his butt and I'm an 11 year old kid watching this thinking yeah. it's the funniest thing I've ever seen. Right. <laughs> So anytime Jim Carrey would come out with a new movie, I would go watch that movie and then I'd have it at home on VHS. I'd watch it a thousand times. And one of the movies that he came out with in the mid 90s, late 90s, mid 90s was The Mask. OK, where he plays a comic book character who after he puts the mask of Loki on, you know, he turns into this like a green character that's a trickster. And. One of the things that he says in this movie, which is so funny, is like something's going on with the bad guy. He like he's it's the first time he meets the bad guy, something like that. And he gets an award and he says, you like me. You really like me. He says it. Right. So he says he says the original. Yes. Right. He says it. And why would they have that in there? Wrong. We're talking about a big Hollywood movie. They wouldn't say that wrong. Right. Right. Right, right. And so why is that know. there? Right. It's that's strange. That is really weird. That is really, really weird. And Lindsay, maybe you can find the clip of him. Yeah, here it is. Thank you. I think you love me. You really love me. Weird. So and now this is where it gets weird again because there is okay now there is a there is a huge group of people saying that Sally Field said you love me you really love me there's another group of people saying you like me you really like me and then what she really said apparently was you you I can't deny the fact that you like me right now you like me right it's just a cluster f of weird in this case you know oh man yeah and i don't think that that's not something you can actually misconstrue as well um yeah i can't I deny can... the fact i mean that's a weird yeah. thing to put in front of that to begin with but i mean it's a weird thing to say to be the whole thing is weird like the whole thing is weird but i can't deny the fact that you like me you really love me right now oh he said you but... No, she said i can't deny the fact that you like me right now you really like me or something uh, <laughs> hold on i can't deny it so so what she said was, I can't deny the fact that you like me right now. You like me. But it was either you like me, you really like me, or you love me, you really love me. And it's much more, it would be much more like a mind F if, it, if the argument was over, you like me or you love me. Right. But it's right. not. It's like right. so different. I don't know, man. The whole statement's just weird to begin with. And the way she's acting is just weird. I can't, I can't watch it anymore. Look at the one. Well, it's also like her perm kind of just like shaking in the. Yeah. It's, it's your head. weird. That Hollywood <laughs> thing, man. I don't know. That's uh, funny. Like, why would you say you like me right now? Like that's going to go away. I don't know, man. Like, like, I don't know that it's not something normal people say to begin with. It isn't. And, and, and no normal person would even put, I can't deny the fact before all that either. Like no normal person says this kind of stuff. Okay. We got, we got to get into one here that I don't. So 
the like a lot of these Mandela effects annoy me, but there is one that's like strange that has to do with the positioning of organs in the human body. Oh, and okay. it is all right. Which one's that? It's the kidneys. Huh? Where so are the kidneys. When you learn kidneys are located in the upper body, not the lower back area. Wait, what? Yeah. They're like down on, on the side, right? They're down on the like lower back side. Yeah. You're experiencing right. a Mandela underneath, like, right underneath now. the, no, they would be, they're not, well, they're protected under the ribs, but they also come. I've gotten hit in the kidneys before and it hurts me, like heck. Yeah, me too. Huh. But like, but you know, you're talking about like your, it's like your mid lower back, right? But the kidneys actually are way up back there. Huh? Like way up there. Uh, more than more than a lot of people remember. Yeah, I don't know. That's one I don't know about. I'm going to have to look at that one. Kidneys. See, this yeah. is where people remember the kidneys being, but they're right. they're like I think they're higher in most or I'm sorry. It's just this whole thing is confusing. This is why the <laughs> organ conversation is like I know the organ conversation's a hard one. It's like I don't know. I don't know when I, when I, you know, it's like, it's who has a personal experience with the organs except for doctors, you know, nurses. Yeah. And so this is a hard one for me. I mean, cause I know some people say something about the heart moved as well, but I just don't know. I have no idea. No, wait, they're not up there. They're like literally like, right. Dude, that's what I'm saying. That That's just a bad illustration. That's just a bad illustration. Is it? <laughs> Wait, I can't figure out where everything is. They're, I don't know. Wait, they're that small too? <laughs> <laughs> they are kind of small. These are just bad illustrations. Man. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and they're off kilter. They're not symmetrical. Come on. Yeah, I, I, all right. These I can't, ones I'm kind can of... be medical images though, like ones that aren't functioning properly. I see. That is true. So um, I think th there's another one. So there's there's a few here. Oh, we're going to keep going with this list, you guys, because there's some really strange stuff going on. And I think some of these, I think there is more likely that there's some type of external agency interference than it being actually a misremembering of something that happened in history. And I think a great example of that is when you try to start talking to people about how many people were in the car with JFK when he got his head hit with a bullet, right? How many do you remember in that car, John? We're ending on a cliffhanger because this goes pretty deep when you start getting into the Mandela effect. And we couldn't end here. There's so many examples of the Mandela effect so we'll be bringing you a lot more in part two of this series. We hope you guys are liking diving into this as much as we are. And if you've had your own experiences, we'd love to hear them. So leave us a comment. Don't forget to like and subscribe on whatever video platform you're watching us on and give us a five-star rating and review if you're listening to the podcast. So join us next time for a show that's out of this world.